So this is our 2015 City Council Candidate Forum. We are holding these forums for each of the 10 districts, and we've had a separate forum for the mayor already. Uh, so this district, this forum today features District 5 and District 8. So we want to be glad that we, or we welcome our candidates here and be for willing, being willing to answer questions and talk about issues that the chamber feels are important to the business community and to San Antonio as a whole. We also want to thank our sponsors, our partners for these events. The University of Texas at San Antonio has offered these facilities free of charge so that we can hold these in a public fashion and, and invite anybody who would like to come and, and view them. We also want to thank our partner, our media partner, Telemundo, uh, for being here and being willing to moderate these events with us. Uh, I'll get in a little bit to who's going to be doing this for us today, so please bear with me as we get to the details. So I want to introduce our moderators today. Adlena Amaro is here today from Telemundo. She joined Telemundo 60 from Univision 23 in Miami, where she worked as a general assignment reporter and correspondent for Noticiero Univision, Edición Nocterna y Despierta América, from 2010 to 2014. I want to get it all right. Okay. Prior to this, she worked at Gen TV 8, WGEN as a legal reporter from 2009 to 2010. Amara also worked at America CV Network in Miami as an anchor and reporter from 2007 to 2009, and at America TV in Miami throughout 2007 as a reporter. She began her broadcast career in 2006 as an assistant producer for Noticiero Univision. She received her Bachelor's of Science degree in Communications and a Bachelor of Arts degree in Spanish from Florida International University. She also holds a Master of Arts degree in Spanish. Please welcome Arlena Amaro. Uh, with her today is a gentleman named Joe Bray. Joe Bray is the Chamber's Vice Chairman for Legislative Affairs. He's been selected by Henry Cisneros, our current chairman, to kind of handle issues around uh, legislative affairs, everything from local, state, and federal. So this year, Joe has had much success in generating lots of interest and in getting information to our board and to our community on all issues that affect our business community, and San Antonio has done a wonderful job at it. Mr. Joe Bray is a longtime member of our chamber and certainly serves as a member of uh, our board of directors as well. Welcome, Mr. Joe Bray. I will go ahead and hand it over to our moderators who will go over the rules, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask so that we have, everybody understands what we're going to be proceeding through the format today. So for now, I'm going to hand it over to Elena, and you can take it from here. Well, good morning to all of you and to the people in the audience. Um, thank you for being here so early on Friday. It's for a good cause. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen and candidates. At this moment, I'm going to ask the candidates to give a one-minute personal opening statement Tell us who you are, where you're from, and any information you can give our audience on a more personal level. Like he just told my whole biography, pretty much, in, a, in one minute. In, chronologic, in chronological order today, we have from District 5, uh, incumbent and current councilwoman, Shirley Gonzalez, and one of her opponents, Alan Warren Townsend. And from District 8, we have with us participating, Yvonne Escobedo Martinez, Robert L. Meeks, and the incumbent and current councilman, Ron Miranda. So, um, applause. Yeah. And then from here, from, from my left to the right, uh, we want you to give, your, to give us a personal note of who you are. So, those of, you, those of us that don't know you will get to know you better. We'll start with you, Shirley. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Shirley Gonzalez, and I'm the current councilwoman for District 5. I live just a few blocks from here in the historic Prospect Hill neighborhood, and normally would have taken the bus here. It's that close, just a few blocks away. Uh, given the rain, I, I didn't have that option this morning. So, And I have my business there uh, at Sarsamon and Commerce. My family owns Bill's Pond and Jewelry. We've been in the same location for 54 years. And recently did a large expansion to the business and it was one of the things that inspired me to run for office was I felt the difficulty of getting my small business to expand in its existing location. We were a very strong, stable business, and uh, it was extremely difficult to get the necessary permits, to get the necessary lending uh, to expand my business. And it was one of the things that inspired me to run for office. I thought I could help other small businesses. 
And of course, the more I learned about it, the more I learned that the important things for the district that are not just small business and job creation, but of course, public safety, uh, basic infrastructure needs, uh, sidewalks and drainage, which we still suffer with. Um, I'll have a terrible time getting back home um, because of the flooding that still occurs in our district. So with all of those things uh, in mind, I went forward uh, with uh, my first term, and I've had some priorities there uh, that I'm, I'm especially proud of that perhaps I don't have the time right now to, to talk about. But uh, I still serve uh, the community with as much enthusiasm as I always have. I wake up every morning inspired to serve and go to bed at night feeling like I've done a very good job. So uh, I, I hope to continue to serve the community and uh, have my focus be on some larger bond projects uh, in the next term. Thank you, Ms. Gonzalez. Now, Mr. Warren Townsend. Hello, folks. Um, I moved to the district about 26 years ago, and I live at 143 Walton Avenue. I've lived there the whole time, uh, and I love it. I think this is one of the best places you could possibly live in the world, and I've lived a few other places in the world. Um, I have a master's degree in political science from, from uh, uh, LSU, and a master's degree in education from UT Austin. I worked for the Alamo Community College District at uh, San Antonio College and at Palo Alto College for uh, my, most of my working life, well, not my, at least the last part of my working life, and then I'm retired, so I'm a retired educator. I've worked in the community pretty much the whole time since I, was, uh, since, uh, I moved into uh, District 5. And I'm president of the Palm Heights Neighborhood Association, also president of the Nogalito Sarsamora Coalition, and I was a founding member of Sidewalks Incorporated. I um, have served on uh, the bond um, uh, committee, the bond oversight committee, and um, on the uh, uh, rate uh, committee for the SAWS. And I've generally been involved in public affairs. So uh, what I bring to you is a background of education, a background of community service, and I felt that the, it's important that we preserve our communities while moving forward, because District 5 <coughs> is really moving forward. We're, we're on the verge of a big um, economic renaissance. So I want to preserve our community. And that's pretty much what I'm about. And the questions, I think, will reveal that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. I want to tell you that I wanted to keep it to one minute. At the end of the debate, you will have two minutes for your closing argument. Thank you. Now, Yvonne Escobedo Martinez. Well, good morning. My name is Yvonne Escobedo Martinez, and I am a San Antonian. I was born here. Um, my family was Air Force, and so we moved for a little bit, but then uh, as I came back to San Antonio, I became a product of Northside District. So I went to Colinas North, Hobby, and then Clark. Uh, I graduated from St. Mary's University with a Bachelor's of Education in Music, and I also teach English and uh, Biology. In essence, um, I am a college career readiness advisor for uh, high school students at Clark High School right now. I am a retired spouse's uh, wife, and um, my husband is Paul Martinez, and he is running for uh, mayor of San Antonio also. I am excited to hear that there's going to be an opportunity for us to uh, continue these information. Now, Mr. Robert Meeks. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, I'm originally from Baltimore, Maryland, so I know the nurses don't hold that against me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I, I'm in San Antonio, you know, being military, I'm a retired veteran, a retired uh, combat veteran, one officer. Um, I served 20 years in the military, both in the Marines and the Army. Um, my extensive career um, overseas uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. I also have an uh, undergrad and master's degree in criminal justice, and I'm completing my, I'm completing my dissertation right now in forensic psychology. Uh, why do I want to run for office? Um, I've been, like I said, I've, I'm from the north. I've been in a lot of major cities. I've been, I've seen the construction. I've seen, you know, how the northern life. Um, since I've moved to San Antonio, and I've been here for a number of years now, what I've noticed is this, this is like a small, a big city with a small town feel. I don't think this city should change. I think it should keep that, keep that feel. 
I think that's it. I think that's it. You should keep that feel. And I think uh, I'm the best person to come here and, and, and help maintain it. I can, I've been to the North. I've seen it. Uh, it's great. It has its pluses. But I love San Antonio. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for being here. My name is Ron Nuremberg. Uh, first and foremost, I am a father and a husband, uh, which drives my decision as being a District 8 City Councilman in significant ways. But I do want to say that prior to me becoming a full-time councilman, I taught and worked at Trinity University, which is my alma mater in San Antonio. And outside of two years of going to graduate school in Philadelphia, I've been a San Antonio resident since 1995. I've been very focused on the long term, big picture in San Antonio, and I've been very proud of the work that we've done. Uh, before coming to Trinity as, as a professional, I worked for a decade at the Annenberg Public Policy Center, working in over 20 different cities around the country on municipal research, civic engagement, and although all the issues that we worked on were different, one was the same, which is no one trusted their government anymore. So I have been focused on uh, conduct of government, the process of government. How can we make the right decisions for our community and the best interests of our community long term? And that requires transparency, accountability, and a laser focus on what's right for the long haul in San Antonio. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nettenberg. Now Mr. Bray is going to read the rules and procedures. We want you to pay attention because we would like everyone to participate in the debate. And, and I want everybody to know I have this big paddle that's uh, right next to me. And it's, uh, there's an attraction to the rules. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, before we begin the questions, I would like to go over the rules. If I could, please. Questions for the candidates will be decided by the moderator. Questions will take approximately 30 seconds to ask. Each question will be limited to one topic and addressed to one candidate at a time. Candidates may or may not be asked the same question by the moderator. Answers will be 90 seconds. There will be a green, yellow, and red light or card to assist you in uh, following the time. At the end of the forum, each candidate, as my colleague has indicated, will have two minutes for a closing statement. Are there any questions? The fun begins. My colleague will ask the first question. Yes. And since you're participating in a type of lottery, uh, the first question that gets to answer this following question will be Alan Townsend. So be ready. <laughs> Don't worry. The question has to do with the CD shutter. One CD shutter proposal for San Antonio voters to decide in Maine is whether city council members should be paid for the service they provide. Here comes the question. Do you support pay for our city council members? I definitely support pay for city council members, and here's why. City council members without pay have to have some source of income. We all have to eat. And they either have to have uh, be independently wealthy or have a source of income that they can do in, in, at the same time that they're being a city council person, or they may possibly get their their money illegally. We don't want them to do any one of those things. What that does is squeeze out uh, people, hardworking people that could be excellent city council people. So what we need to do is make sure that um, a person can devote full time to city council. And I know that wasn't the, t the case in the old days, but it certainly is now. Everybody expects uh, a city councilman to be a, a full time person. And we need to pay them uh, and make sure that they can live on that and then hold them to their feet to the fire. They need to work the, the full time that they're there, and I promise I will. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Townsend. Now, Ms. Gonzalez, will you accept the pay structure if approved by voters? Oh, absolutely. And I think the uh, council pay is really critical for the city. I, I'm especially proud of the council that serves now. We're a especially educated group of people. I think we're a really professional group of people, and I think we represent this city uh, as well as any other city can be represented anywhere in the country. Uh, but it does limit the pool of participants that can serve, and then of course limits the amount of, of, of uh, uh, people that can serve, but also the professions that can serve. So as was mentioned, one person has to be retired independently wealthy or have a small business, which I'm fortunate to have. But 
It does make for a very long day. I've been serving in meetings um, from 8 to 8 every day this week. And so it makes it very difficult to maintain my job and even to pay for a babysitter and makes it very difficult to maintain a certain standard of living. So I think it's especially critical that we bring this city up to what is cons consistent with other cities around the country. $45,000 is significantly lower than other cities get, but I think it's a good starting point. And I look forward to having the voters support that uh, in the elections in May. Thank you very much. And now from District 8, the first person that won the lottery was Yvonne Martinez, so you get to answer the question first. And the question, and the question will be, do you believe that city council pay will change the dynamic of who will run for city council in the future? Yes, I do believe that it will change uh, accordingly to um, the voters' turnout. You need the voter turnout to come out and help change. I think that it is important that the voter turnout come so that the city council can change and have uh, new blood. Thank you. Now, Mr. Meeks, please. The, the question is related to the city charter. Will you accept the pay structure if approved by voters in May? Yes, ma'am. I think that's a, a great idea because, again, it separates the, it, it brings all the citizens to the table, um, whether they're rich, they're retired, they're retired, or, you know, they're making moderate amount of money. Uh, again, $40,000 isn't, it's significant enough to survive on, but again, you're, you're dedicating 90% of your time out here to pop up, you know, politicians or to out here in the rallies and to, orchest to orchestrating your community and making sure everything works. So do I, do I believe they need a salary? Uh, a slight salary. Um, but yes, I think that would be, I'm totally agree on one. Now, Mr. Nirenberg, uh, do you support pay for a city council member? And do you think that that will change the dynamic of the current city council? So I've always said that I, no public official should give himself a raise, but I do think it's in the domain of, of the public to make this decision for the long term of San Antonio. As a, as a citizen, I do believe we need to create access and opportunity for people to pursue a uh, career in public service. We need good people to serve. And it is an obstacle for people, uh, knowing that there is no living wage, there is no pay for council to devote full time to, to this. My commitment has been that no matter the outcome of this vote, and I know how I will vote personally, no matter the outcome of this vote, I'm committed 100% to serving the people of District A in the city of San Antonio. The issue, though, of whether or not we'll change the dynamic is a, is a, is a complex one. Pay in and of itself won't do it. We need to have active and informed residents. Most uh, San Antonians don't get involved in municipal elections, not because they don't want to vote, it's because they're not informed about what they're voting for, and they're not informed about why it's important and what city council does. Most of the residents I talked to were unaware that city council doesn't get paid. The idea of new blood, uh, that comment was made, you know, it's, it's great political talk, but one of the challenges on city council is that we've had so much new blood in the last two years, we have had no stability. And one of the, one of the ways that we can introduce new stability, better thinking, long-term decision-making is by allowing uh, good people to serve and serve for uh, as long as the public will accept their uh, decision-making. Thank you, now we'll pass it on to Thank you so much. My colleague did such a good job. I hope I can follow in her footsteps. Ron, um, I'd like, since you ans answered the question last, I'd just like to start with you, if I could, please. And the question is, San Antonio has an established city manager form of government, as we know. My question to you is, do you support Cheryl Scully as our current city manager? I do, and the reason why I do is all of the performance measures that we give city management in terms of financial management, our bond rating, uh, the fact that we want to get lean and mean as a city, as a city government, get, us, get small but get high performance, the, the performance indicators for all departments in terms of service delivery and efficiency, lowering crime rate, all these things have happened under Cheryl Scully's leadership, and it's not been easy. Granted, it has not been easy. Uh, and in fact, I think it's justifiable that somebody who acts as the CEO or the COO of our city 
does get the criticism and the praise when things go right or they go wrong. Um, I think, based on what we brought her here to do, what she's challenged to do in a $2.4 billion organization, she has done a, a fabulous job for the city. We are still, uh, as far as major cities, top 10 cities in the United States, one of the strongest uh, economically, uh, one of the best in terms of quality of life, and our trajectory is fantastic. People want to come to San Antonio, they want to stay in San Antonio when they arrive, and I'm proud to, to, to live in a city where we can say that. Great, thank you, Ron. I'll move right over to Mr. Meeks. And before I ask you the question, Mr. Meeks, I want to thank you for your service to our country. It is greatly appreciated. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. My question along the same lines is, if elected, how would you approach your relationship to Cheryl Scully? I think it needs to be a little bit more detailed on the, on the I want to I hit back on the budget. I know we didn't cover it a little bit, but uh, um, I've, I've covered the budget. This budget's like 658 pages or something like that. Um, I think the overall management is on marginal. Um, she can go a little more in depth. Even as, that's probably one of the hardest things with the with the population. They have a harder understanding of what exactly their money is going to. Uh, like like me, and everyone manages their budget at home. Everyone knows exactly, hey, where my money is going exactly. And if it's not, does the rest come back to me? Or you know, I think uh, Lucia pulls like an income, or a income tax return for for making mess left over. Um, because even when you look at the budget and the way it's being managed, you know, $2.2 billion is, is what the budget is allocated. But has anyone ever, ever seen a budget spent exactly to $2.2 billion? Where is the remaining of it? Or where is it, what is it used afterwards? I know uh, there's a charter on the next, uh, on, on, on this coming election where the, the, the city manager has the ability to reallocate that money to wherever they need to put it into. Um, has it been done in the past? I don't think it has been done correctly. Um, so that falls back on the manager. Uh, the city manager. So no, I don't. I don't think she's been doing her job for, uh, like she should. Uh, I think it could be done better. Maybe. Thank you for your thank you for your answer, Ms. Martinez. I'll follow up right with you and ask you: Is this council manager form of government best for San Antonio? The council form of government is best for San Antonio. The council is in charge, or at least that's how it was supposed to be. Uh, as far as uh, Ms. Scully, I would definitely work with her, uh, but I think everyone needs to know that she is not the one in charge. The council is who uh, elected her in, and they should be in charge of what needs to go on. Great, thank you for your response. Mr. Townsend, yes. same question. Do you support Cheryl Scully as our current city manager? Okay, I think Cheryl Scully is one of the best possible city managers we could have. That being said, I don't agree with everything that she's done, but I think that she really is doing a terrific job as a city manager. Now, we have a weak mayor and council system compared to the city manager. Theoretically, the city manager should be in control of the city and the council and mayor should be sort of like a board of directors. But of course that's not how it works, and that's not how it should work. What I think is, instead of arguing about who's in charge and stuff, I think the people need to be in charge. We need to go beyond the city manager and beyond Cheryl Scully and put the decisions in the hands of, of the people in the district. And that's what I propose to do with uh, participatory budgeting. The idea of participatory budgeting is that we take the budget uh, and as much as possible, give those those budgetary decisions to uh, the, the citizens who live in the district, in fact, the residents of the district, get them to propose projects, vet them with the city manager and with the uh, city staff, bring them back to, the, to councils, uh, put them on a ballot and let them vote, and the best projects win. And that is it. And I promise as a city councilman that I will do that and I'll get out of the way of the people and, and uh, expedite that process. Now, it's a little bit radical, apparently. I didn't think it was all that big a deal, but apparently it's fairly radical. But it's the best solution, and thank you. All great responses. Thank you to all candidates. And for you, Ms. Gonzalez, the same question. How would you approach your relationship with Cheryl Scully, and do you feel that council, manager, form of government is best for San Antonio? 
Well, that's what we have now. Um, and I think it's working very well for San Antonio. I think Cheryl Scully is one of the hardest working women I've ever met. And if you send her an email at five o'clock in the morning, she responds. Really uh, professional and it's a very complicated budget. And I think she does a wonderful job of trying to break it down, whether it's for the council or whether we go out to the public when we have our budget sessions. Uh, I think that uh, San Antonio has managed to stay strong even in, in the most difficult times that we experienced in the uh, early uh, 2000s. And she's done a great job of managing that and still producing l large bond projects, some of which we've never seen in our city. And also uh, maintaining a, the AAA bond rating, which we know is critical to the success of San Antonio and for our long-term goals. Uh, I think Cheryl Scully is a uh, extremely competent city manager. I absolutely think that she is top-notch and I, I enjoy working with her, uh, especially because not only does she have a large picture, uh, broad picture of where we need to go in the future, but she can still remember even the small details. So when we discuss some of the smaller infrastructure projects in my district, uh, she's equally aware of them as she is of the big scale, large picture of bond for the next 2017. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I would like to start with Ms. Gonzalez since you were the last one to answer. The next question is about economic development. The Alamo is the historical shrine for San Antonio, our state, and the whole nation. As a member of the city council, will you support the funding and actions necessary to restore the current site, to reflect its original configuration, and to be very specific about it? Will you support the necessary property and business acquisition to complete social reconstruction? But it's been uh, on the forefront of all of our minds. It's been one of the major topics of discussion uh, at council, um, given the large uh, dollar amount that is necessary to restore the Alamo and to make it the, the shrine that it really what it should be. Um, the numbers that have been thrown out are in the five hundred million dollar range, and um, the uh, eminent domain that's threatening uh, is a great concern of mine. Um, so I, I look forward to continued dialogue. We have a task force now on how we can restore the Alamo. We know that there has been um, a lot of discussion about it. And I would like for that discussion to continue further. It's a um, very controversial issue and uh, something that I think needs to be taken with great sensitivity. So I look forward to the continued discussions on it. Um, I would just like to get a full picture before we make any major decisions. A lot of that is concerning imminent domain, which gives me great pause. Um, so I would like, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to having the Alamo be the, the focus of the city as it was intended to be, as it is, has been for the last 300 years. So um, I, I uh, look forward to the tax. We do have a tax force and tri chairs that are looking into that issue, and I look forward to hearing more of their reports. Not all of you need to answer that question, but do any of you want to answer that, or do you want us to go into the next economic development session? Mr. Meeks. Okay. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not from here originally. And the one thing I've noticed uh, since I've been here is, you know, historically, the Alamo is where, you know, the Alamo has a lot of historic, you know, historically, people in San Antonio is to go to the Alamo. Um, I'm a huge history buff. Um, when I got here, I went down and I went through every single aspect of the Alamo, um, read every single board. Um, that is what brings people to out, not, not solely to San Antonio, but to San Antonio. Everyone wants to see history, history in the making. We need to reserve everything that's there and preserve it, whatever at any cost, because again, that is what I love. Everyone loves to, you know, to bring this on the past. Everyone loves to see what happened, the growth, to see where we originally were to where we are today. Uh, if you see the, the size of I mean, being the seventh largest city in the, in, the, in the country, it's great to know that I'm, in, I'm a part of history here every day in San Antonio. Um, that's why I love the Alamo. Um, I mean, well, you support the funding then? I support the funding, and, and, I, and I think that that's great for the business. That's great as far as uh, um, visitors coming here, because as far as the commercial business, always hiring people. Uh, I'm all about the Alamo Plaza, uh, all about you know renewal and making sure that we maintain the history. Because at the end of the day, if you forget the history, you know you repeat the history. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Meeks. 
Um, Mr. Townsend, you would like to answer that same question? Briefly, yes. First of all, I don't have any idea what Shirley just said. But anyway, the Alamo, of course, we're the Alamo City. Everybody says we're the Alamo City. And we definitely need to take a serious uh, role in, in protecting and enhancing the Alamo. Now, as far as the city taking on the full burden, no. We can't do that. We don't have that kind of money. But there are, plenty, there are organizations in the state that are interested. We need to make sure that um, the state is, is, takes its fair share without gobbling up the whole thing and taking it away from, from the local people. We need to make sure that uh, we, we have a coalition of people that care about the Alamo as a historical place, that have a reverence for it in terms of the, the place where Texas uh, basically was born. And we need to do all this with humility and with understanding and we need to do it um, with money, of course, but not all of it spent by the, uh, the uh, city of San Antonio. We've got to have help, and I think we can have help. Thank you. I would like to direct the next question to Ms. Martinez and Mr. Nuremberg, because you have an answer. The question is as follows. Do you support spending taxpayer dollars to promote the recruitment and relocation of a professional football and or soccer team? Will you support spending taxpayer dollars to promote the recruitment? Yes. The reason I support it is because if you go back, uh, when Katrina happened and people came in from New Orleans, we packed out the Alamo Dome for all the different events that were set aside. If you looked across um, the seats, it wasn't just people from New Orleans. It was San Antonians. And guess what? That brings jobs. It brings expansion. It brings new businesses and um, even businesses uh, that are small can help out and receive profit from that. So I do believe that it's going to take a little bit of our money to start that, but guess what? I think it could be just as big, if not bigger, than our Spurs. And we back everything 100% once we've decided to do so. So yes. It's not going to take a, a little bit of money. It's going to take a lot of money. And I think we need to be very careful. Um, I think San Antonio is a big league city. We're an NFL-ready city. But I would not support using public funds for bringing an NFL team here without a public vote. Because more than likely, what is going to be required by an NFL franchise is a major overhaul of an existing facility or um, a complete construction of a, of a new facility. Um, and that's where we need to be careful. I, I'm an NFL fan, believe me. And I do believe that, believe that there is economic potential there if it's done right, if it's done in the right place. Um, we've seen many cases across the country where a stadium is developed with the promise of economic development and it becomes a great big hole in downtown. We don't want to see that. We've got to have a plan uh, to make it a vibrant community center if we go that route. But in the end of the day, I would not support a major investment of public dollars into a, a private corporation like that uh, unless there was a, a, a show of public consent through a vote. Thank you. I would like to pass to Mr. Gray for more questions. Great, thank you very much. Um, uh, we have so many good questions here, and I wish we had time to get them to get them all in. But we're going to be running tight. This is one question, however, I would like each candidate to address. I'm going to start with Mr. Meeks, if I could, please, because I believe this is probably one of the most important questions that you will face as a council member if elected. The city public safety functions, police, fire, and EMS are supported by the city's general fund. This fund also supports other key functions, such as libraries, parks, street repairs, and code enforcement. Alone, the public safety departments uh, constitute the largest uh, general fund expenditure of the city budget, which has resulted in fewer funds being available for other city needs. Do you support the city's negotiations to reduce police and fire department benefits that would limit those expo expenditures 
to no more than 66% of the city budget. Mr. Meeks. Now, one thing, uh, one thing I've excluded in my bio is I had history. Uh, I've also been an auxiliary, auxiliary sheriff's department deputy in, uh, in Oklahoma. But one thing I've noticed is, is they spend time and time daily uh, making sure that our safety is maintained. Um, I think they should be on the pay. I think uh, putting them, um, giving them the option to have to burden the cost of uh, Medicare or medical and dental is is a hard burden uh, because they give time and time daily to maintain our safety. Um, I think reducing their budget will put a lot more constraints. You know, you only have like 2,700 police officers, which in a city of um, over a million people, that's really, really uh, tight. Uh, I think we should not decrease their budget. In fact, we should give them more. Uh, it, it helps them and help our community because there are more officers out there they're doing, they're being there to patrol more, they're being there to, to keep our safety. And, and again, on the fire department too, they, they keep our safety down. And uh, I, just, I just think we don't, we don't do enough for them. And anytime we have to, you know, again, they already have the burden of maintaining our safety, we shouldn't have to give up more financial burden on it. I'll shift it to Ms. Uh, Gonzalez. Your comments, please. Uh in District 5, I think there's no doubt that the greatest concern for our residents is public safety. So making sure that we have a workforce that is qualified and prepared, I think, is especially critical. So with that in mind, uh, we have to strike the right balance of public safety needs and the needs of uh, basic infrastructure, sidewalks, lighting. That being said, uh, I, I feel like right now the best way to try to get some of that underway is, is dealing with the uh, health care costs. Uh, the health care costs are through the, roof, they're through the roof for everybody. And so trying to get that in check, I think, is where we can start to make some real improvements in the public safety uh, budget and, and what is taking up so much of that. So um, I, I think that starting from there uh, and asking them to participate in that part uh, is reasonable, and I hope that at the end of the, this process, which has gone on quite some time now, we can strike that right balance. I think 66% is a number that uh, everybody has agreed is pretty stable or is consistent. We would like not to go beyond that. Uh, but still having the qualified workforce, having sufficient workforce, uh, and having them come to their jobs every day feeling um, that they are, are, are protected by the city and, and, and respected by the citizens is equally important. Great, thank you so much. And I'll pass it on to Ms. Martinez, but I want to add to this just a few comments, please. Um, and are you, are you aware that independent studies were done that indicate that our police and fire uh, department members are some of the highest paid in the state when compared to the major metropolitan cities? Uh, yes, I am aware that they are the highest paid, but let me explain. Uh, you get what you pay for. <laughs> and when you are in a fire or you're in an accident, you don't care how much someone is being paid when it's your life on the line or someone you love. So that in itself tells me that they are uh, very well uh, believed in by us. But as far as um, supporting, reducing their pay, no. In fact, I would not support that at all. I would take them out of the general fund and put them into the protected fund. I would remove pre-K-4 and replace them with our officers, letting them know, and our fire department, letting them know that we back them more than 100%. Because guess what? It's their lives on the line every single time. We expect them to show up as soon as we need them. We do not want them to sit there and say, oh, well, I'll think about it. No, I expect them to show up. I need them to show up. Very good, thank you very much. Mr. Townsend, your comments, please. Okay, the first thing is, of course, we need heroes. We need firemen, we need policemen, and we need them to do their jobs. Now, how much are we gonna compensate them for it? Surely, uh, the, the bank can't be uh, broken by uh, just saying, well, they can have anything they want. Uh, we, it has to be a judicious process. 
I would have been really interested to hear how Shirley was planning to uh, reduce health uh, costs for the police and fire. Uh, we didn't hear that, and maybe maybe after it's over, I, I will hear about that. But the thing is, however you get, uh, and and police and fire argue that they're that this sixty six percent thing is not a fair assessment because uh, that that the the comparisons. And this is getting into the weeds, but that the comparisons are apples and oranges and so forth. All I know is this: the police and fire deserve to be compensated. They, uh, but there's a limit to how much money we've got, and we have to balance those two things uh, of, of fair compensation. Maybe we need more money, and I hate to tell, tell people this, but it may be that we actually need more money, money to run the city. So far, it looks like um, we don't. It looks like we're able to stay within our means, and I hope, we'll, of course, we have to. We can't just continue to say, well, they get everything they want. So this is a complicated uh, subject. It really needs to be negotiated as a union agreement between fire and poli uh, police and the city. And I hope by the time I'm a council person that it'll be done. But if not, I'm happy to wade into it if, that, if uh, people ask me to do so. It, it is a complicated <coughs> matter. It, I have no easy, quick answer for it. Thank you and, very much. Uh, okay. As I did before, I'm going to add a, a couple of tidbits here. How do you think the city civilian employees feel when they have to pay a portion of their health care benefits? Police and fire do not. In addition to some of the other, in, in addition to the question I've asked. What's taking us two years to talk about the city? I'll do my best. I, I certainly think on the last point that there's probably you know there's probably some some difficult feelings there. Uh, at no time, however, has this council ever said that uh, that uniformed personnel should have the same benefits as civilian personnel. So that's never been on the type of table. And one of the challenges here, there's just a tremendous amount of uh, misinformation, and I'm hearing it up here also. First thing. Pre-K for SA is a sales tax initiative. There, there's no way we could take that off the table and use revenue for that for this. So that's one. The second is, at no time has, has City Council or anyone else ever suggested we're going to reduce pay for uniform employees. In fact, every single proposal that the City has put forward, falling under the 66%, has been increased pay in the contract. That's the second point. The third is, this is this a philosophical issue. You know, we can say all day long, yes, Absolutely. If you're if you have an emergency, we want them to get there. We want to have personnel to do it. Streets street safety is part of that solution. Sixty six percent in those costs that are not contained, i.e., healthcare only, trending at seven percent increase a year as opposed to two and a half percent increase per year in city revenues. That's the stuff we need to focus on, and that's what we're committed to do. But but the the talk about us reducing benefits, reducing pay, they are still going to have. Absolutely the greatest package, I think, in the state of Texas. In fact, we are not reducing benefits. We're simply trying to adjust utilization and adjust costs. Great. Thank uh, you very much. Thank you. Okay, I'll turn it over to my colleague. Yes, thank you very much. The next question has to do with infrastructure. I'll start with you, Mr. Nittenberg, since you're the last one to answer. Traffic congestion continues to be a critical issue for our economy. And there are multiple solutions needed to address it. Do you support the use of managed portal lane as one of these transportation solutions for traffic congestion? Well, count me among the people who hate congestion. Uh, count me among the people who don't like toll roads. Uh, but count me among the people who are still waiting for a plan for building streets without, with the existing revenues that we have. The reality is, in the MPO, in the city of San Antonio, in the city of Texas, Bear County, RMA, whoever you get together, and we all have to get together to build major roads, we have to build roads and have plans to build roads with constrained finances. That's the only reason why you're seeing managed lanes, as a, as a creative alternative to do that. Um, the day that a free uh, system of highways that addresses congestion that helps build our infrastructure at the pace of our population growth comes before me, I will prefer that plan over, over, over a managed lane plan. Uh, but we have yet to see that. And that's why we're pushing so hard on a multimodal comprehensive transportation plan as well, which is all free. Uh, we're building out our arterials, we're using our resources, we're trying to contain costs in other areas. 
to help with the free options and help to get people in San Antonio and our economy moving. Um, we want to have options for travelers, uh, but we also want to have resources. And let me clarify one thing before it's set up here, which is we will not, absolutely not, there's no politician would approve tolling existing lanes. We're simply, the plan is to add additional capacity that would be tolled only for those people who use it. Uh, so the, the free lanes that we paid for, absolutely, I will, I will put my name on there, but will remain free. Uh, if I have anything to do with it. Okay. Now, Mr. Thompson, would you like to elaborate on that? Okay. Uh, I think Mr. Nuremberg makes a really good case, and maybe that's what's going to have to happen. The thing is, we if we're going to take care of uh, public, I mean, of transportation at all, you know, the pollution that it is, the, the backups, the stops, and so forth, we got to get cars off the road. And not the total solution to that, but at least a big part of that is to increase public transportation, uh, increase its share of ridership. Now, in order to do that, you've got to have clean, safe, affordable, convenient public transportation. The um, uh, VIA has been making a good start with uh, a toe in the water, at least, um, with bus rapid transit. And that should be expanded. We need to have more frequent and nicer buses, and they're moving in that direction. I know it's a big expense, but it's a lot cheaper than, than uh, trying to build more and more highways. So I would put an emphasis on public transportation, on making it possible for people to get where they want to go without getting in their car. And sometimes that means walkability. Oh, those are a lot better solution than having toll roads or having, um, of course, we're probably going to end up with managed lanes, given the number of people that are moving here. But let's try to keep it down and let's try to make public transportation a lot more attractive. Thank you, Mr. Townsend. And the next question will be directed to Ms. Martinez and Mr. Mix. It, it also has to do with infrastructure. Your district remains a high growth, high demand area. What are your plans to address the infrastructure capacity as your district continues to grow at increasing rates? Thank you. Um, the one thing, uh, the one thing we, we're forgetting here is, uh, you know, you're looking at the council. Um, as we expand, and again, District 8 is really, really dynamic. It's really diverse. It's really explosive, explosive on most of the cities. Um, it's, it's to get with the, it's to get with the, uh, the community. You know, you know, when you bring in some new infrastructure, you bring in some new areas, you're making sure that it's blessed off by the community. Because, you know, who, who likes high dollar construction in their neighborhood if they need to, or a lot of construction? So if we can, if we can pull this, you know, put it for the vote for the community to make sure that, you know, any, or, any new organizations coming in, any new industries coming in, and they agree with it, and it meets the, you know, it meets the community standard, then we should, you know, welcome any new advancements or new infrastructure increases. Um, again, we have a lot of area, a lot of area out there, a lot of natural resources in District 8. I, I go out every week, uh, every so often, and walk the park every week. Uh, I love my parks, but I also love industry coming into the bill, and, and, and industry coming into the, uh, the community. So, again, at the end of the day, we need to pull our community because, you know, city council voting on increased uh, industries or building the infrastructure doesn't pan out very well if the community is not all about it. Ms. Martinez, what would be your plans to address the infrastructure capacity as your district continues to grow? Well, I agree with Mr. Meeks. I certainly would expect to have uh, neighborhood association meetings to find out what the constituents want and need. But first and foremost, I think that we would need to make sure that what is being taken care of now actually finishes. The transparency of not knowing why the frontage roads or because um, I live out towards Bernie Stage Road mm -hmm. are not being taken care of even though it's a beautiful sunny day and you just keep going and guess what you don't see anybody out there working so I would like to know the reasons why I would like to have them held accountable to know what is going on with what we have given them already does that make sense yes. <laughs> um, but in addition to that I think that it it is uh, important to know that our constituents 
who we represent, okay, who vote us in, are the ones that get the say so. It's not what I want. It's what they want and what they need that's most important. Thank you. I would like to give Ms. Gonzalez the chance of, ask, of answering this question from basically from our viewers. So this is the community interested in this answer. For high school graduates in your district, discuss the importance of higher education and how will you increase opportunities for them? District 5 still continues to have the highest dropout rates in the city. So this is a critical importance to, to me and to my district and to the overall long-term well-being of my community. One of the things that's been happening a lot is that we are having uh, what is a, called a, 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 their joint college associate high school programs where students that are in high school uh, can go straight into an associate's degree program and graduate from high school with an associate's degree. We hope that that will then encourage them to continue on to their four-year degrees, but at least it gives them an opportunity to start work with an associate's degree, trained and prepared and ready to work if that is their desire. I think that the stabilization uh, of, of my community is extremely dependent on the success of our public school system. And we've got to work, continue to work together to advance that cause. So that's one of the programs uh, that we're working on with the schools to help them with their associate's degree. Another thing is the workforce training that so many of our nonprofits are doing that will help students, whether it's they need uh, help to stay in school, whether they need tutoring, whether they need on-the-job training uh, at a young age, and giving people job opportunities and so we were working with some small businesses and some of the large corporations uh, to give high school students jobs and opportunities to work. Specifically, CPS Energy has a program where we are getting, uh, I think they offer uh, internships for uh, 50 high school students to give them opportunity uh, to work. And so that's one of the few ways that we can help uh, our, our students uh, be more successful in their long-term careers. Thank you, Ms. Gonzalez. I would like to pass it on now to well, thank you very much. Ron, I'd like to go back to you and ask you the question that was specifically developed for District 8. And talk about the, the uh, address the issues of in infrastructure capacity and the issues that relate to that in your district, please. Uh, they're massive. Um, growth in San Antonio over over the two censuses, 20, 2000 to 2010 was 16%. It was 33% in District 8. Coming out of the recession, we're seeing incredible capital investment, which has got great economic development opportunity, but incredible infrastructure challenges. So everything we're facing at the city, natural resources, supplying water, energy, as well as the basic streets and uh, drainage and road infrastructure we're seeing in District 8. What I focused on is delivering the projects on time. The largest uh, voter approved roadway project in the city's history is Hausman Boulevard. That's on time and on budget. We're working on developing a plan with TxDOT to uh, address the Wurzbach corridor west of the parkway, the west of the parkway at uh, you know, Lock Hill Selma is where the city takes over it. Uh, we're also working on the medical center and improving pedestrian and vehicular safety in and around that area because not just for medical community, but it, this is the a third of our GDP. This is, this is $31 billion annual economic impact for the city of San Antonio every year. The challenge, particularly for neighborhoods in District 8, has been traveling east and west, getting to and from the corridor. Um, I, I, uh, I hear what uh, Yvonne was saying. Uh, in fact, I, I texted Mike Frisbee the other day, the director of TCI, when I was driving down I-10. I said, what are all these tech stop trucks doing here? They're not rolling. It's beautiful outside. It's 9 a.m. Um, there, there is a schedule. They're falling behind. So we got to work with uh, tech stop also. Uh, who has the, the authority on, tech, on I-10 to help complete those projects on time as well. Great, thank you very much. Mr. Townsend, to you, specifically District 5, talk to us about uh, high school graduates and education and the need to provide quality education for our high school kids. Okay, I, when I was working for San Antonio College, I was involved in a program called Tech Prep, which is what Shirley was just talking about, where you merge uh, uh, the second, the last two years of high school with at least the first year, and maybe even possibly the second year, but at least the first year of community college. And we, we build programs, and I think we should continue to do that. The, the main problem with school and people that live in our district 
is that they look at school and they say, well, I guess that's what I have to do until I get the chance to get a job, rather than thinking of it as a preparation for a job. So what we have to do is build bridges, make that uh, the school that people have totally relevant to the life that they're hoping to live, their work life, uh, after they graduate. And I've got some ideas for that. Apprenticeships are good. Um, that's not so easy to build, but you know, the, the Port of San Antonio has got some really nice programs where people can work. Uh, internships are great. And we ought to, the city ought to take an aggressive stance towards building these kinds of relationships so that small businesses even, not the gigantic ones, but even small businesses like printers and uh, barbers and whatever can take on people as uh, either apprentices or as uh, interns. And that that is just a step towards it. Now there's a lot more to the problem, but I haven't got time to talk about it, so thank you. You, you probably would like to have the time. I would like to have That would be lovely. Well, if we could, please. So many great questions. So many good answers. Can we go into um, the closing statements? If we could, please. Let's start with District 8 and Ms. Martinez. Yes. <coughs> Two minutes, please. Well, like I said, my name is Yvonne Escuela Martinez, and I am running for District 8 because I believe that our Neighborhoods need their voice back in the city government. I feel that it is important that they be heard and that we listen to all of our constituents and that they have a vote in everything that is uh, necessary for them to vote in. Uh, I know that um, we also are working towards advancing San Antonio and I want to be a part of that. I have always been a leader in the service industry, whether it be a teacher or within my community or within my church or even within the military. I have a heart for service and I would greatly appreciate uh, and consider it an honor if uh, my constituents would vote me in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if we could please uh, Move on to for District 5. The first one up would be Mr. Townsend. Two minutes, please. Okay. Thanks for having me here. Uh, we've had a chance to talk about a number of things. I want you to know that my basic focus is the community. We have got a precious set of communities that you can think of as a tapestry in District 5. And we have to nourish and strengthen those communities. That's what I'm all about. Now, that doesn't mean that everything comes down to District 5, but insofar as the individuals, the, the citizens, can be involved in, in making decisions, I want to see that happen. My major issue is participatory budgeting, and that's sort of one prong of direct democracy. By that I mean that people, the people, the residents of the district, should make decisions that affect them in terms of the, the infrastructure and the other things that happen during the district. We can do this. This is not a, a pie in the sky idea. This is something that's being done all over the country. In Vallejo, California, it's citywide. In Chicago, one uh, person has done, Joe Moore has done his district for the last four years. In uh, New York, in Brooklyn and so forth. We can talk about this. But anyway, this is not a weird, off-the-wall idea. This is something we can bring the people into the process, and this will quicken the whole process and make it, and of course I'm interested in making it a lot more transparent to people. I think that'll, that will cause uh, a, the ability to be able to uh, uh, understand what's happening on the part of the citizens and therefore, they will become more engaged, and you won't have something, a fiasco like the streetcar downtown, where the really good-hearted big guys decided there was going to be a streetcar and didn't bother to ask people until it was too late. We've got to ask them initially. Okay, and that's thank you, why thank you very much. Uh, let's shift to District 8. Mr. Nuremberg, two minutes, please. Great. Well... I'm running for re-election because I, uh, there's a lot of great work that we've done, a lot of great work left to do in District 8 throughout the city of San Antonio. Um, 
my main focus is harnessing the growth of San Antonio so that all of us, every resident of San Antonio can benefit, every hardworking San Antonio can enjoy the growth uh, and the opportunities of growth in San Antonio. I've been focused on issues of transparency. You, all, you, uh, you heard me say that in the opening statement. What we've done there is we've brought these sessions, the work of City Council, to the television, to webcast, so people can be more involved in that. What I've done for the District 8 community is built a District 8 Community Academy that has brought the District 8 constituent offices and all the work that we do in the neighborhoods to the neighborhoods rather than having them have to come to us. We've had town hall meetings every week, every month. We've had quarterly HOA presidents meetings. And we've also brought the permitting activity, the, the concerns that residents raise when, they're, when they see new construction in the neighborhoods. We put that online so now that they can be involved in that. Now we have to take it one step further and get people involved in their government um, on, on every decision. Um, we've also worked on the long-term growth issues of San Antonio in infrastructure needs for, for our district and for San Antonio, but also through the long-term vision of building a great city here in San Antonio, Texas. We're working on building a comprehensive plan. I'm proud to chair that. Uh, and we're working on a comprehensive water strategy to make sure that we finally address what has been one of the major uh, issues in long-term growth of San Antonio, and that is ensuring long-term water security. And finally, what I'm trying to do is make sure that our city is healthy for the long term uh, in terms of our fiscal management and our long-term decision making. What I'm most proud of that we've accomplished over the last couple of years is set a record in District 8 that we will be thoughtful, that we will research the issue, and we will make the best decisions in the best interests of our neighbors. And I'm, I'm proud to serve. It's the honor of my life to serve, and I look forward to being reelected. Great, thank you so much for your response. We'll shift to District 5. Ms. Gonzalez, please, two minutes. Thank you very much, and I think this has been a great forum. I've really appreciated the questions that we have here, really diverse and, and at the same time specific to our district. So thank you all for the thoughtful questions. Uh, I'm Shirley Gonzalez, uh, asking to be reelected for District 5, uh, to really remain community focused. Uh, we have so many issues in District 5 that really still need to be addressed. I said on the MPO, which I'm hoping will bring additional funding to our district, some of the main projects that we've still got to address in District 5 uh, have to do with basic transportation issues, a bridge over Spree and City Road, uh, that I'm hoping we can redirect some MPO funds to. Uh, the bridge over Spree City Road is really critical to our community because of the increased train traffic uh, that we expect in Eagle Ford Shale, uh, and we expect in UP, uh, people can be delayed as long as 30 minutes is just enough for a specific area. And so I'm looking forward to addressing some of those issues and working with the bond uh, to get District 5 all of the infrastructure that it needs, all of the basic services that we still so much need, uh, and working with our public safety team uh, to make District 5 the safest community uh, in San Antonio. I still believe and have believed that District 5 is the best place to live in San Antonio. And getting that funding that we need for our parks, for our creeks, uh, Elmendorf Park, I think, is a great example of a $15 million investment uh, in our community, much longer overdue. The community's been working on that project for over 10 years, and we're just now seeing that come to fruition. So I look forward to working on those projects uh, that we know uh, are basic quality of life issues for our community, and look forward to bringing District 5 uh, up to the rest of the city, which has been uh, left behind for such a long time, but still at the same time, uh, uh, taking advantage of the great resources that we have, number one, the people, but also having a walkable, sustainable, uh, quality of life community that we can all be proud of. Great, thank you so much. And last but never least, <laughs> District 8. Mr. Meeks, please, two minutes. All right, um, again, thank you for attending, and uh, thank you for listening. The one thing I hear on this table uh, consistently, granted, I'm city council, I'm for District 8, but as a, as a District 8 council, you have effects on every district in this city. It's not just District 8. You know, you vote in on every district. You know, your decisions, the actions you make, the researches you, you do, the, the, the theory, the policies you approve affect the entire city. You know, don't just, I'm not just here for District 8. Yes, I am here voted, you're gonna be voting in District 8, but I affect all, this, all of the city in what you're voted in. My thing is, I've been to a lot of cities. You know, I love San Antonio. I love the atmosphere. I love the community relationships. I love the way we interact in the South, specifically in San Antonio. 
We need to keep it that way. One thing that I, you know, I am a director of IT, we need to, you know, and, and he did a great job at, at bringing it to uh, television and the internet, but we need to pull it more. We need more of a pull it integrated into the, 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 the IT. We are in a modern age. We can do anything with a text message. You know, integrate, bringing the community back into the, the interaction with the, 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 with the council. You know, sending a text message, sending a poll. You know, getting live feed on what's going on in the city, what's going on when they do city council meetings. That's what I want to bring to the table here. I would like to bring these up to date modern technologies to home so everyone can interact daily in real in real time. Um, that's something we're missing here. You know, in education, not only educating the youth, but educating the parents. You know, I didn't get the answer question on the high school, but I think education has to start at home even in the community and the government. So we need to start, at, even on the city council, as an educator, educating the community so that the message gets out and people understand what is going on. I'm Robert Meeks and I'm the district. What a great experience. Thank you all for participating. It is important for our community to hear from you. So thank you for taking your time, waking up early, and being here sharp and answering all the questions. Now it's time to hear from the chamber. Matt, we have heard a number of perspectives, ideas. I hope that you feel that we have covered uh, a number of things that affect not just these respective districts, but the city as a whole. So I want to thank you. Let's give a round of applause to our candidates. We do want to wrap up, and I will personally thank our moderators for taking the time as well to be here and be prepared for our event today. As a follow-up, let me just, uh, I want to thank uh, University of Texas San Antonio downtown for allowing us to use these facilities and serving as a partner, and also with Telemundo, who is serving as our media sponsor again. I want to thank them for their assistance with these programs as well. To wrap up, I will tell you that we have our next forum, which will cover District 6 and 7, on Wednesday, April 15th. It will be right here, same place, 8 a.m. Come and learn it for breakfast as well. We will have our final forum on April 29th, which will cover Districts 9 and 10. You're welcome to attend any of these, any and all of these as well. And let your friends and family know as well. Again, thank you so much for everybody being here. We stand adjourned. Good to see you. Good to see you.